Hi and welcome back to another free webinar by MDCT. So this is part two of a four part series on emergency radiology imaging. So in this lecture we're going to look at primarily only head CT imaging and we're going to look at the patterns and analysis of bleeds. So now let's look at the different types of bleeds. The first type is an extradural hematoma or epidural hematoma. This is the only type of fracture of the skull where it will have an associated extradural hematoma and bleed. And the reason why this actually shows you as a concave appearance is because between the sutures of the sagittal suture and of course the squamous suture, you have ligaments which are attaching the actual peristeal layer which sits above the meningeal layer and it actually creates like an anchoring point for the brain and the tissue. And so with all extradural hematomas, you will always have a skull fracture. So when performing uh, your reconstructions in head CT, it's always important to do an axial and coronal soft tissue brain, plus you always do an axial bone window brain high resolution. The reason is with an extradural hematoma and a concave appearance, it will always be accompanied by a skull fracture. And then we could determine where the location of the injury is and what has occurred. And so what happens here is you will get tearing and stripping of both layers of the inner table of the skull. You get the laceration of the periosteal layer. And sometimes you can get actually le you get lesions or sectioning of the meningeal dura. And then blood between these two areas begins to fill. More importantly, when you're looking at an extradural hematoma, you actually see, if you can see between the diagrammatic image and the radiological image, there will be an intracranial shift. You have a concave appearance and the blood density is almost the same as the density of bone, determining this is an acute epidural hematoma. And this type of patient would need urgent surgical intervention. Here is another case of a patient who has an obvious bone fracture, which is seen by the red arrow. The concave appearance, which is almost like a ball, which is protruding out. And there is also mild intracranial shifting. Here is another example of an epidural hematoma, which shows that there is an associated skull fracture. It is often occurs when an impact fractures the skull. The fractured bone then lacerates a dural artery or a venous sinus, so it could be both arterial or venous. The blood from the ruptured, ruptured vessels then collects between the skull and the dura. So on CT, the hematoma forms a hyperdense biconvex mass. It's usually uniformly high density, but may contain hypodense foci due to active bleeding. So it's really dependent. More importantly, sometimes you can cause these hypodense uh, areas because, because of the blood clotting. And since an epidural hematoma is extradural, it can cross the dural reflections unlike the subdural hematoma, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this is a typical example where you have the extradural hematoma it's pushing on the actual lateral ventricle causing compression. And with these types of fractures, then we start to see the different types of herniations. So you can actually see you can have subthalcine herniations. You can have uncle herniations, which sit between the cerebellar tentoria above the superior vault versus the inferior vault. Okay, And then you can actually start to get a blown pupil. And this is where we see the bleed is because of the fourth nerve or the trochlear nerve. The next one we're going to talk about is a subdural hematoma. The subdural hematoma, this is where you actually end up having ruptured cortical veins only. Whereas in the extra dural, you could have either cortical veins or arteries. And this usually occurs between the meningeal layer and the arachnoid mater, which sits in the, sub, in the space, which is above the subarachnoid space. And here, this is when you start to get a convex appearance whereas before we saw it as a concave appearance so you, as you can see here you have your acute subdural hematoma where you have a density between 45 to 60 
There is a large intracranial shift because you can see the Falx cerebro has shifted. There is also a collapse of the right uh, occipital horn of the lateral ventricle. And so this patient would need urgent surgical intervention. Here is another example of a radiological example with and without decompression and how it affects over time. So as you can see, you have sulcal effacement. Then you can have shifting from right to left. And then you'll start to see subthalcine herniation. And as we saw this before with extradural hematoma, this is where the tissue up in the temporal area will drop below the falx cerebri and push to the opposite side. Again, you can also have chronic subdural hematomas. Usually these are hyperdense or crescent-shaped appearances, and they can have a mass effect. And with this instance here, we have loss of the um, petrous segment of the lateral ventricle. And you have a combination of both acute and chronic, because with the chronic, you actually see it's filled with fluid, which you can see anteriorly. Whereas in the mid-segment below, there is a density of about 40 Hounsford units. And as you can see, we need to determine whether there is or is not intracranial shifting. And this is where the importance of patient positioning comes from. And more importantly, if you are centering the brain in the center of the CT scan with perfect centering, with our recent publication in 2016, we showed that you will not get these subtle differences, whether anatomically or radiologically, when we did the blind study on radiologists, to actually see that there is loss of the grow up matter differentiation. So if you have a look here, there's another two types of both chronic and chronic with an acute bleed of a subdural hematoma. Here is another example which demonstrates high density of the hematoma as you can see on the image to your left. The image on the right shows a hypodense region or a circular region. This most likely represents a blood clot in there. However, there is intracranial shifting and is raised intracranial pressure because we have lost the lateral ventricle of the occipital lobe. And more importantly, if you can't remember the type of bleed, just remember the banana or the lemon. The lemon is a large citric fruit. If you throw it against something, it will, because it's heavy and dense, it will fracture. So it will have a definite bone fracture. And then also it represents one side of the lemon. So we always call this an extradural hematoma. If you have a crescent shape appearance, always remember the banana. This will determine that this is a subdural hematoma. The next type of blood in the brain that we will talk about is subarachnoid hemorrhage. This may occur in association with intracerebral uh, or extracerebral bleeds. Usually you have increased attenuation in the CSF space, and this is where most of the blood vessels actually pass and run through. So a subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs when an injury of a small artery or vein in the surface of the brain or in the subarachnoid space. This vessel then bleeds uh, between the pia and arachnoid mater. And the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. In the absence of trauma, the most common cause is a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Therefore, when traumatic sub Arachnoid hemorrhage occurs most commonly over the cerebral convexities or adjacent to otherwise injured brain. And if there is a large amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage, particularly in the basilar cisterns, this is where the physician, the radiologist, or even the radiographer, when first looking at it, should determine or understand that there could be a berry aneurysm that has burst. So therefore, on CT, subarachnoid hemorrhage appears as a focal high density in the sulci and fissures or linear hyperdensities in the cerebral sulci. And if you do suspect these linear hyperintensities, then you need to consider to proceed with a circle of Willis angiogram. And if you had interventional radiology with retrieval for stroke, then you would proceed to do a carotid and a circle of Willis CTA. So clinically, there are five grades of subarachnoid hemorrhage where you have a slight headache, it's asymptomatic, and so forth. However, more importantly, is radiologically subarachnoid hemorrhage. Grade one, you would never be able to see, and the only time you could see a grade one subarachnoid hemorrhage if you proceed to perform uh, 
a, sub, a uh, lumbar puncture where we test the CSF fluid to see if there is actually blood in there. Grade 2 is less than 1 millimeter thick. Grade 3 is more than 1 millimeter thick. And of course, if you go to grade 4, it could be any thickness with intraparenchymal or intraventricular extension. More importantly, once it gets into the intraventricular system, that means there has been a lot of circulation in the CSF fluid. There is a lot of bleeding that's occurring and storing into the brain. So as you can see here, the image to your left, where this is where subtle subarachnoid hemorrhaging based with poor patient positioning. As you can see bilaterally posteriorly, you can actually see there's loss of the gray white matter junction. There are linear intensities, but you would think to yourself this could be positioning artifact because of CT, because you're off this, uh, you're off from the isocenter of the scanner. Therefore, the amount of the linear attenuation profiles as the tube is rotating is not superimposed on top of each other, giving us partial volume artifacts. However, when you go back and perform the coronal reconstruction, you can obviously see with the yellow arrows this is definitely a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here, this is another case of a patient where you actually see there is blood in the entire cistern system and in the middle cerebellar artery region or space, you see there's quite a large fluid in there. Definitely, this patient has a grade 4 subarachnoid hemorrhage and this is due to a ruptured barrier aneurysm at the middle, middle cerebellar artery territory. This is another example. This is a patient who has an extra dural hematoma on the right side and a subarachnoid hemorrhage on the left side. So you can actually have a combination of bleeds in the same patient. And if there is an abnormal increased attenuation due to fresh blood in the fourth ventricle, as you can see on the image to the right, this, and there is no other blood where you can see it because of the large artifacts, you can actually determine that this patient is, has a settling down or an old subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now let's look at the intracranial hemorrhage or intraparenchymal hemorrhage. The important thing here is, is that diffuse axonal injury likes to occur at the junction between the gray and white matter. And the reason of this is because we've already said before the gray matter is four times more as dense than the white matter. Therefore, if energy is applied to two different densities and it's passing through two different types of tissue, the differentiation in expansion and contraction is different. So this is where it likes to tear at this junction. And another reason why it likes to also occur there is because the superficial cortical veins and arteries will come down through the subarachnoid space in the meninges. It will pass through both the gray and white matter. And then they have an area of anastomosis where they connect. So tearing occurs at where these red circles are, which is the difference in densities where these vessels are. A typical example here shows you that there is complete diffuse external injuries between greater and white matter junctions symmetrically. Another type of bleed that we don't talk about or we maybe haven't spent much time on in this lecture series is the coupe and countercoop contusion. If your force or your head hits directly onto a steering wheel as you go head on collision, the coupe contusion will actually occur at the site of the impact. Whereas the counter coupe will actually occur at the site of impact and in the same direction in which the energy passed through, completely on the opposite side. So if I show you this radiological example, the blue arrow shows us the direction of force. The yellow arrow shows me that there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage because we can actually see uh, linear attenuation intensities throughout the sulci. Also, outside the brain, we actually see a large um, hematoma outside the skull. And then if we draw a line at the site of impact and we see the blood exactly on the opposite side, there is another subarachnoid hemorrhage and a little bit anterior to it, just lateral or inferior to the sylvian fissure, we see a diffuse axonal bleed. So this is a typical coupe and counter coupe blood density pattern.
More importantly, when you're looking at different types of bleeds, the one here on your left shows that there's an early contusion and edema and there is slight effacement of the basal cisterns. And then the same patient had a scan three days later and it showed there was an increased size of the contusion and edema where the red line is demonstrates there was an intracranial shift and there was complete effacement. And this point here, when you have effacement of the basal cisterns, that means we have raised intracranial pressure. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to this lecture. Just remember, everything is figure outable. For more free learning and education, please visit us at mdct.com.au. Also, we run a lot of conferences all over the world and please contact us and we'll be more than happy to come to your country. Take care.